Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 101, February 20th to February 26th, 1863. Last week, we mentioned the Cowskin Prairie Council amongst the Cherokee. We also had action in Arkansas at McGraw's Mill. Finally, we went over a segment on the French intervention into Mexico and how America was affected and affected the outcome of that conflict. This week, we are going to have a deep dive into guerrilla activity. It is something we have talked about frequently, but never really have gone too far in depth. Before we do that, we do have a Patreon episode posted. This is going to be the memoir reviews for Rufus Dawes, and Dawes serves in the 6th Wisconsin. That's the Iron Brigade, and he's already, of course, been in our story, and he will be in our story here in the future. So this is kind of like Elisha Hunt Rhodes and his memoir review. Elisha Hunt Rhodes uh, does start off as a private, and moves his way up through the ranks. Dawes, I think, starts off as a lieutenant and then kind of moves his way up as well. So it's similar progression in that regard, um, but uh, also a little bit different than Rhodes, I think, and we'll see, of course, in the review. Um, Then for March, I think we're going back-to-back memoir reviews here uh, because we do have an event that ties into our story very nicely today and that... We have some action in Northern Virginia with John Singleton Mosby, and Mosby is, of course, probably the most famous partisan ranger during the war, and uh, he does some raiding, a uh, Fairfax courthouse raid. Uh, lines up pretty nicely here with the month of March, so I also have his memoir review uh, here in the works, and so we'll probably post that as well, and then go from there. So if either of those things sounds like it would be interesting to you, in the show description, there's a link to the Patreon. And of course, the proceeds go toward the general upkeep of the show. Just have another quick announcement as well. I mentioned the website uh, every episode and uh, there's a link to the website. Um, I do also want to mention, and I think I've done this uh, a couple times here, that if you would like a better medium, perhaps, Uh, to view the posts that I have that go along with the episodes. There's some photos, maps as well. Uh, There is a Wix app you can download. Wix is obviously the website uh, that I go through, right, Um, for the blog posts. So um, if you want to download their app uh, and you'll get email notifications when I do have those posted. Um, And uh, so that might be a better medium to view those kinds of things. If you say you're just looking at your phone, I know um, it works pretty well for me where you know, I'm, I'm able to actually have the podcast playing and then I can pull up uh, the pictures or the maps or whatever and just have that in the palm of my hand if I need to. So um, that could be something that if that interests you as well, um, it's the Wix app. And uh, I'm going to try to post in the show description about that as well, just as a reminder. Let's first get a example of irregular warfare in Tennessee. On February 25th, we have Confederate guerrillas attacking a 240 mule train in Woodburn, Tennessee. The guerrillas stopped the train and captured or burned the supplies. It is worth mentioning that we are still at a standstill in Tennessee following the Battle of Stones River both sides waiting for the campaigning season to begin. Now this is indicative of the kind of activity we see from guerrillas throughout the conflict. I also want to mention that there were pro-Union guerrillas who had victimized the rebel supply lines. Memoirs we have read even include such activity by irregular forces to disrupt their enemy, but let's go more in depth. Just to circle back around here, Uh, And we'll talk about this here in future episodes, that 
the situation in Tennessee is very much at a standstill, right? But guerrilla activity does play a large part in the lack of movement by the part of the Union Army. There's always supply issues, and if you're getting your supplies nipped off here and there by guerrillas, then it's probably not going to be conducive to campaigning deeper into enemy territory. So that's a big roadblock that the federal armies have to get across, right? I think oftentimes it's interesting. We see, and we see this even in contemporary sources where most notably, I think recently back in 1862, we had Lincoln looking at a map and asking Fremont, why couldn't he move from here to there? And the terrain is just not conducive to that, right? The mountainous terrain, he wasn't able to just simply walk the miles or so into the Shenandoah Valley. Now, sometimes I think also we th- we look at a map and we say, well, why couldn't they just go from here to there? And that's part of the reason. There's, there's more reasons than that, but these are what we're going to talk about today. Part of the reasons why you can't just go pell-mell into uh, the deep south. We have mentioned several times about the brutality of the war in Missouri and the aspect that guerrillas played on the war in general. Today, I want to get a little bit more in depth. First and foremost, we need to talk about irregular warfare. Henry Halleck will equate the irregulars to land pirates, which is what they were in essence. There were no rules with their service and no rules of war that had to be observed. In that sense, partisans were a little bit different. Mosby's partisan rangers, for instance, were part of the Confederate Army. As such, they were governed by the rules of war. In theory, they would not be able to loot, pillage, or kill civilians or prisoners. Now, there is a famous incident where Mosby does execute some prisoners, or at least Mosby's rangers do, but we'll talk about that more in depth here later. And, of course, we're actually going to cover that in his memoir review, so once again, a shameless plug for the memoir review on the Patreon feed. The other thing I do want to mention here at the top is in regards to guerrillas and irregular warfare, that this type of conflict realistically is not meant to win the war, so to speak. Looking at a more modern example, the Free French Movement is not going to defeat Nazi Germany on their own. Likewise, partisan movements in, say, Yugoslavia would have a tough time of battlefield victory if there were not allied field armies engaging the majority of the German war machine. So the purpose is to prolong the war, especially in the case of Confederate guerrillas. Making the life difficult for the Union forces in occupying areas was the name of the game. More resources that were either destroyed or being diverted to these regions would be categorized as successful operations. So we need to keep that in mind moving forward. We need to ask the question of why individuals reverted to irregular warfare. It is an obvious correlation that if you feel strongly about the war, you probably have joined a more regular force. So maybe individuals were either less zealous in the cause, or they were opportunistic. I'm hoping to highlight some memoirs in the Patreon of guerrillas who fought especially in Missouri and see their motivations. Specifically in the case of Missouri, there was already a culture that included this kind of warfare from bleeding Kansas. It is interesting when talking about culture, though. This guerrilla conflict had already been part of the culture for Native Americans, most definitely introducing these tactics in North America. It is interesting, too, when you read some of these accounts that there are federal officers, and actually officers on both sides, they refer to this kind of warfare and these kinds of individuals as savages, right? And that's a derogatory term that a lot of, say, early settlers and and even into the 1800s, right, uh, used for the Native peoples that are already here. So there's an interesting correlation there that they equate the type of war that they wage uh, to Native Americans. So there's there's an interesting, uh, like I said, interesting connection there. These kinds of tactics, of course, were regarded as not being honorable by most in polite society. If we remember those Napoleonic tactics and Victorian ideals that we're still operating under 
but I think there had been much in terms of study into guerrilla activity, some of which is interesting, as I have found in my research. For instance, guerrilla activity picks up after emancipation in Missouri. Obviously, there were those who did not feel strong enough to fight, but when one of the war goals shifted to potentially ending their way of life, this need to resist was born out of necessity. It's also interesting, I mentioned that, you know, maybe they didn't serve in the regular Confederate forces, especially in this particular instance in Missouri. A lot of them did, and we see that in John McCorkle's memoir that's very... I'm probably not going to do it in the Patreon because it's very action-packed. It's like something's happening every second. Um, so there's not a whole lot of downtime to really talk about it. You'd have to be talking about the entire thing, really. Um, but it's an, an interesting read uh, for that reason. But he does serve in the Confederate Army. I believe uh, the Youngers serve in the Confederate Army. And that's, you know, Cole Younger uh, of the Younger James gang, right? Jesse James. So they do serve in the initial part of the war but then shift to kind of defend their home and wage war in this alternative fashion. It did not help that the Missouri Union troops had a large German population, this influx of immigrants already being seen as encroaching on their society in a negative way. So you combine both of those factors and you get an increase in activity. This is also confirmed by mapping activity in an essay from Civil War Guerrilla. Most of the violence would occur in areas with brief Union occupation. Foraging efforts and a more heavy hand when it came to guerrillas was not good to limiting the irregulars. Moving into an area not normally containing a military presence would put this on display. There was likewise a correlation with a Confederate military presence and an increase in activity. We can connect this to a previous point. Guerrilla activity on its own is not sustainable. When it became clear that there would be no more Confederate incursions into Missouri, the bushwhacking would essentially stop. Many of the guerrillas just hung up their spurs and went home. It's hard not to focus specifically on the war in Missouri, but this would have been the most hotly contested area when it came to guerrilla fighting. Except for the large German population, especially as the war dragged on, there was more sympathy to the Southerners in the state. Even militia units were reportedly full of pro-Southern men. The reason being was there was a call for men to swear an oath of allegiance to the Union or face consequences that included property confiscation. Action in Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and even North Carolina also punctuated pro-Union guerrilla operations, but it was not quite on the same scale. While Missouri had been experiencing something similar since Bleeding Kansas, these areas were new to the violence and in many places, scores were continued to be settled well after the war. Remember that in many communities, these families knew each other, and furthermore, they knew political affiliations and potential service either for the Confederacy or in the Federal Army. The irregular warfare, though, on both sides oftentimes broke down to thievery that did not target victims so much as proved to be more for the opportunistic hunters. Jayhawking militias raiding from Kansas would actually turn off some of the anti-slavery households in Missouri because of their activity once inside the state. There is a well-known incident where William Quantrill reprimands Bloody Bill Anderson for his stealing of horses, and we'll talk about horses here later in the episode. It was something that made them successful. Overall, the taking of goods led to the raid on Lawrence, Kansas, which we will get into later this year. Reportedly, the bushwhackers reported finding large stores of captured material in the abolitionist stronghold. This leads us to a good point when talking about this irregular warfare, and that is that the kind of defense of the home was already being practiced with Bleeding Kansas. Guerrilla groups were supported by their homesteads, and because of this, they often were better fed than the regular soldiers in the army. Obviously, home cooking was a major plus and greatly improved morale. 
It was hard for anyone outside of these connected family groups to assimilate into this culture. William Quantrell, one of the more famous guerrilla leaders, started as a hired hand, turned hired gun, and then married into the network, showing the importance of these connections. On the flip side of this, the Union Army would target this support system as a way to get at the guerrillas, which was often met with brutal retaliation. I think it is important to note, though, that the Federals were just as likely for violence. They would take no quarter with guerrillas and imprison family members. We will get into it later this year, but four women were killed in a prison collapse in St. Louis, which is specifically pointed out by Bill Anderson in a note. Several of the women who were injured and some killed were actually kin to Bill Anderson, so he kind of goes off the rails after that. And while it doesn't justify violence or by any means, but uh, you can't really blame him for going a little crazy after that, right? Border ruffians and jayhawkers work well suited to the tactics and weapons that will allow for rapid action. Many started the war armed with rifles and shotguns, but especially for the Confederates, starting with the capture of the Federal arms at Independence, there shifted to be an emphasis on revolvers. Many of the guerrillas were armed with multiple pistols, ready for an individualized warfare unique to the conflict in Missouri. Colt Navy revolvers allowed for the guerrillas to even the score when outnumbered, but they sacrificed the ability for ranged warfare provided by rifled muskets. Because of this, the war was up close and personal for the rebels, which, depending on how you look at it, was either a testament to the contemporary stylings of manhood provided a source of trauma, or also made them hardened killers, or maybe even a combination of all of those things. Their lack of uniforms as well as their arms and appearance would reflect this culture. Guerrillas often wore homemade shirts, sometimes in a more outlandish style, decorated with flowers. Made by the women of the household mostly, these were also contained pockets for ammunition, so they served a functional purpose as well. As opposed to being clean-shaven, these men would let their hair and beards grow, making them more wild in appearance. A Confederate in Price's invading army of 1864, invading Missouri that is, would write that the guerrillas were savages, which is a common comparison in writing. We actually talked about that here already. Scalping of victims by the guerrillas led them to be an overall impression of bloodthirsty nature for these men. And scalping there also you can kind of connect that to uh, Native American culture, right? So it is, like I said, very interesting to, uh, to look at these things. I've seen many arguments that these were just violence-loving, sadistic, criminal individuals. And maybe there were some of those, but also this was violence being met with violence. It certainly does not help in the PR department, though, when you are a dirty, bearded bushman armed to the teeth with revolvers wearing a flamboyant shirt with scalps hanging off your saddle. In terms of recruiting, maybe that would attract a certain type of individual. That's very true, right? Uh, it is interesting, though, when you see pictures of these guys, and they're often displaying all the revolvers they have, and they are very much armed with the teeth, you know, four or five revolvers. Um, so it is a very interesting type of warfare, and a warfare, as I mentioned, that you have to get very close to kill individuals and you know obviously that's going to probably bring on some PTSD uh, after the war during the war after the war right so we know that some of these individuals did suffer from these kinds of ailments but how exactly does the federal army deal with guerrillas we have already answered that they would do so with a hard hand Missouri needed to be occupied to be subdued which speaks to the amount of activity in the state. Having a hard hand when dealing with these guerrillas started with Henry Halleck, who was organizing Missouri, if you recall following Fremont and his heavy-handed tactics, including his premature emancipation, which did not sit well with the slave-holding families of the state. Now, Old Brains has this friend, who is a lawyer by the name of Franz Lieber. Lieber comes up with what would be known as the Lieber Code, which defines these guerrillas not as soldiers, but criminals, a way in which the Federals can run up the black flag, as it were, and eliminate captured enemies, or simply not take prisoners at all. 
This was not the only thing the Libra Code covered. It was actually a variety of topics pertinent to the war effort for the Union at this time. It mentioned humane treatment of prisoners and the civilian populace, as well as the taking of black prisoners by the Confederacy. Notably, though, for the situation in Missouri, it also had stipulations for enemy combatants not in uniform. According to Lieber, enemy combatants received their supplies from a conventional source, aka a conventional source when we're talking about military organizations. So if you have a quartermaster or a commissary, then you have a professional support system, and you're good to be extended the courtesies of an enemy combatant. If you are not being supplied in that way, well, tough cookies according to this code. Things get complicated when we talk about the Partisan Ranger Act, because as part of that act, the Confederacy was actually giving at least some sort of material support to these Partisan Ranger groups and guerrillas, so it does kind of muddy the waters a little bit. But when the Confederacy gets rid of the Partisan Ranger Act, and really the only individuals who are allowed to operate are Mosby and McNeil in Virginia, then it, like I said, becomes more complicated. Guerrillas were often supplied from the home, as mentioned. War material was stolen or otherwise brought into the state within their own networks. They were even wary of Confederate regular army help. There was also the forced relocation of the families who would be able to provide this network. We'll talk about it here, like I said, later in the year, but Thomas Ewing would take this to the next level following the raid on Lawrence. Families along the border would be moved eventually to Indiana to get them away from the irregulars and remove the possibility of continued assistance. While we have been focusing primarily on Missouri, we do need to mention that already in our story there has been guerrilla activity. Western Virginia, it should be noted, had bands on both sides operating against one another. Much like in other places, there were certainly personal scores to be settled but the strong unionists of the mountain country would resist the efforts of Robert Garnett to retake that territory. You, of course, remember Garnett from Rich Mountain. East Tennessee had Felix Zollicoffer operating against unionists as well. Champ Ferguson would combat a unionist leader known as Tinker Dave in this region. Actually, you talk about scores being settled after the war. These guys were bitter rivals in this region, and... Ferguson gets put on trial, and Tinker Dave is actually able to testify against him, and Ferguson gets uh, executed after the war for war crimes. There's theories that he killed a certain number of men, and he was probably more into the sadistic killer category than anything else. Kentucky would actually also start to see irregular warfare, but they would be behind the other states because of their original neutrality. All of the southern states started to have home guard units we can also equate to irregular soldiers or even guerrillas. Remember how the American Revolution was used as inspiration for the South. While Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, was a famous figure from the Revolution and sort of the poster child for partisan activity. But the effectiveness of guerrillas is questionable as a whole. They tied down troops but they also denied the Confederacy manpower in the conventional war, as well as supplies. State governments would try to harness the power of the different bands, sometimes attempting to trade supplies and maybe a partisan status for the chain of command leading to Richmond, but these met with limited success. In fact, we already talked about the Partisan Act, but many soldiers would take advantage of that, and they would not be so easily governed. There are several instances of the guerrillas becoming inconvenient to not only the government, but also the citizenry of the South. In Louisiana, bands of irregulars would come in from outside the state, especially from Texas. While these men were necessary in keeping the Union troops from advancing their gains they made in 1862, they were also hampering civilians because of reprisals. The Northern Army and Navy would level these on the civilian population, burning plantations as retaliation for what the guerrillas were doing on the Mississippi River. Richard Taylor would make controlling these bands and keeping the non-combatants satisfied a priority during his tenure commanding the department. Mississippi is another example of how the guerrillas 
more than likely hindered the rebel war effort. Following the setbacks at Ayuka and Corinth, men who would otherwise have been in the army probably reverted to irregular warfare. Thus, they would not be organized and not be used in the defense of Vicksburg. In Texas, it was actually thrown out that perhaps the Confederate war effort would be better off without Quantrill and his men showing up there, not because they were not useful for operations in that department, but because on a moral ground, they were not welcome. It's actually oftentimes you see in these memoirs that when things got too hot or they needed to winter somewhere, the guerrillas would often head to Texas. And like I said, there's a mixed reception for them when they get there, right? Just given what we've already talked about. Starting with Henry Halleck and his assessment of what was necessary to deal with the guerrilla problem in Missouri, there started to be a heavy hand against the enemy. Towns and homes were burned and potential guilty guerrillas were executed. Some generals would try to combat this type of war with irregular tactics of their own. We mentioned John C. Fremont and his use of Jesse Scouts. During the Grierson Raid, the cavalry would discard the Union Blue to blend in and disrupt the Confederate war effort. Not the entire command, but at least some of the scouts would do such a thing. Frustrations would arise from many Union soldiers and officers, especially when faced with a lawless enemy and potentially lenient commanders who would pardon would-be guerrillas accepting their false oaths to the United States. There are many instances of retaliation on towns throughout the South as the war progressed. As a practical measure, there were a series of blockhouses and stockades constructed to protect the Union supply lines. These were usually garrisoned by infantry, though, which was not going to be as effective when fighting guerrillas who used horses to their advantage. In fact, lack of a strong Union cavalry presence in general was a problem. The use of mules was also an idea to maybe provide infantry a way to chase down their foes. The Navy actually had a Marine Brigade under Alfred Ellett. Using small, fast craft, they would be able to respond to potential river threats. These men proved to be ill-disciplined and accomplished little except burning houses and towns. It is interesting that we mentioned horses and how that's an important part of being a guerrilla, being able to have these lightning strikes, fast actions, being able to get away, more importantly, after these actions, was key to the success for irregular soldiers. Some of these accounts and memoirs do pretty good service into pointing out just how important horses were, and if you didn't have one, then you might as well be a dead man, right? So it is interesting to see just how warfare is evolving throughout the conflict and in the conventional sense and even in the irregular sense we're going to see the use of rapid infantry units and cavalry units acting as infantry on the field of battle nathan bedford forrest already has his command john hunt morgan as well they have their commands set up in such a way where they're essentially mounted infantry they don't have sabers they don't have any cavalry charges that aren't used in tandem with having revolvers or some kind of weapon that they can use while on horseback. So it's interesting to see how the war evolves in all these different facets. Confederate citizens would grow increasingly wary of the guerrillas, so the Union Army took advantage of this, coaxing otherwise reluctant Unionists to come forward and assist in scouting or anti-guerrilla activity. Establishing pro-Union communities was also attempted in Arkansas. Lincoln supported state governments wishing to come back into the fold, such as in Missouri, Tennessee, and West Virginia. This would be a drive for more legitimacy in their war against the guerrillas. Conscription and the length of the war would ultimately be the undoing for the Confederates in this sense. Unionists would combine with deserters, draft dodgers, and otherwise nefarious characters in many places in the South. North Carolina, who had a lot of pro-Union sentiment, was one such area. Many citizens in the South would grow tired of guerrillas, still operating in a seemingly losing effort 
and as a result, have the Union Army exact revenge. Likewise, the Confederate government did not utilize their regulars as well as they could have. We have already mentioned that both sides being unsupportive, they were also attempting to incorporate them into the conventional war, something the individualistic guerrillas were not accepting of. Something that we didn't necessarily touch too f- much on and when we're talking about revolvers and how you had many pistols, you were armed to the teeth, right? Well, that is just case in point example. You're kind of a one-man army and you can fight on your own if you need to. And that's indicative of the kind of warfare that's being fought, especially in Missouri amongst these other places. So that's another good thing to mention too. We had it at the top of the episode, but we there are situations in history where partisan activity and, and this irregular type of warfare, guerrilla activity end up working. But again, it's something that has to happen over time. There has to be a very long period of time where this is going on for and that's time that I don't think the confederacy really has during the war you know you can even kind of point to the American revolution and eventually the British get tired of throwing in their resources and there's other places that they could be better protecting in terms of their colonies so they kind of just decide hey we're not going to be in this conflict anymore and there is a standing revolutionary field army but it's not like that field army was nearly as successful, I would say, in my opinion, as uh, Robert E. Lee was in the East, right? I would even sort of contend that even the Confederate war machine as a whole is more successful, even with, say, Braxton Bragg in the Western Theater and Joseph Johnson. They're not necessarily geniuses when it comes to the war, at least not in my opinion. They don't win a whole lot of battles. Braxton Bragg really only wins one major battle. So, It is interesting to compare the two and you got to be going through years and years of this kind of style of warfare to really be successful if that's where you're going to put all your eggs into the basket of. And that's just something that the federal government is not going to allow in this case and something that the Confederacy just can't wait around to have happen. So that's that's really, in my opinion, why it, it fails. By the end of the conflict, many of the famous guerrilla chiefs would either be dead or captured, as well as executed. Even though John Hunt Morgan straddled the line of a Confederate guerrilla, he was used for valuable symbolism. We mentioned John Hunt Morgan and his tactics, and Nathan Bedford Forrest we can also kind of point out as having these kinds of tactics um, that are similar. But John Hunt Morgan was dead. So too were Quantrell, Bloody Bill Anderson, George Todd, and the already mentioned Champ Ferguson, amongst others. We're going to talk more about the events connected with guerrillas as we move forward, but I think it was important to get a good summary of motives and actions and keep those in mind as we progress through our story. Let's stop there for today. This week we talked exclusively about guerrilla activity in the Civil War, We need to keep in mind that this irregular conflict is waged by both sides during the war and even beyond. Next week, we have a few events, including the beginning of conscription in the North, copperheads, and we're not talking about snakes, as well as brief stops in Georgia and Tennessee. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Post in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.